The remote hearing of the Capital Investment Committee for February 24th is called to order. This remote hearing is taking place in accordance with House Rule 10.01 and is being live streamed by the House Public Information Office. Mr. Wilcox, please take the roll. Chair Lee. Lee present. Lee present. Vice Chair Murphy. Murphy present. Murphy present. Representative Erdahl. Representative Erdahl. Representative Agbaje. Present. Agbaje present. Representative Berg. Present. Berg present. Representative Davids. Davids present. Davids present. Representative Frankie. Frankie present. Frankie present. Representative Freiberg. Present. Freiberg present. Representative Hansen. Present. Hansen present. Representative Hewitt. Present. Hewitt present. Representative Lilly. Lilly present. Lily present. Representative Lucero. Representative Lucero. Representative Moran. Present. Moran present. Representative Pearson. Pearson present. Pearson present. Representative Raleigh. Raleigh present. Raleigh present. Representative Rasmussen. Rasmussen present. Rasmussen present. Representative Ryer. Ryer present. Ryer present. Representative West. West present. West present. Representative Jean. Jean present. Jean present. Representative Erdahl. And Representative Lucero. All right, Mr. Chair, we do have a quorum. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wilcox. Uh, quorum is present. Uh, members, before we get started with the agenda today, I just want to acknowledge uh, some of the ongoing development that we are seeing uh, in the world and in Ukraine. And just want to let everyone know that you know many Minnesotans are hearing this morning, those that are from Ukraine descent, uh, those are that are suffering uh, injustices in our backyard. And I just want to uh, ask all of us to remember our responsibilities to the people of Minnesota and to continue doing the work that uh, we are sitting here today to do. And we just need to make sure that we do the due diligence to really make sure that the lives of everyone is improved through the work that we are doing in our committee and through our Florida debates and sessions. And I really appreciate all of you being on this morning. Uh, Chair Murphy, may I have a motion to approve the minutes for Tuesday, February 22nd? Yes, I move um, to approve the minutes for Tuesday, February 22nd. Uh, Chair Murphy moves approval of the minutes for Tuesday, February 22nd. Any discussion? Okay, none. Those in favor say aye. 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 Those say nay. The motion prevail and the minutes for Tuesday, February 22nd are approved. Uh, we have a very full agenda today, and to start off, we have a presentation for the Minnesota Port Association on their bonding request. Welcome to the committee, and please identify yourself and proceed. Thank you. Um, uh, good morning, Chair Lee, Vice Chair Murphy, and representatives. My name is Deborah DeLuca. I am the Executive Director of the Duluth Seaway Port Authority. I am President of the Minnesota Ports Association and Chair of the Minnesota Freight Advisory Committee. It's my honor to talk to you today about the Port Development Assistance Grant Program, which we call PDAP, which is administered by the Minnesota Department of Transportation. I would like to thank uh, Representative Pulowski and Representative Haley as chief author and co-author respectively of House File 1005, which was introduced last year and which supports 28 million in funding for PDAP. I'd also like to thank Representatives Olson and Schultz who co-authored the bill as well. Um, I want to remind you how we arrived at that $28 million figure. The four port authorities on the Minnesota Ports Association, which are Red Wing, Duluth, Winona, and St. Paul, um, uh, each have uh, identified port pri priority port infrastructure projects. Uh, and these are, these are planned and, uh, you know, they've been planned for the past couple of years. And they are presented on a list that's in your packet, a port priority project list. Um, those, the total cost of these projects sums to 34.5 million and the PDAP program requires a 20% match. So that 28 million is the remaining 80% of the total project costs of these projects of regional significance. Um, I should take the time to thank you for the support of this program, which uh, throughout the years, which has enabled the Port Authorities to make 
uh, ongoing and steady progress in repairing and replacing and improving essential port infrastructure, which supports supply chains uh, uh, for agriculture, manufacture, and um, energy in the state. With each of the investments we make, we improve the competitive position of several sectors of Minnesota's economy. While the activity relating to loading and unloading cargo takes place right at our port terminals, the benefits are shared across the state. Our ports move soybeans, corn, other grains, uh, other ag products, as well as construction materials down the Mississippi River and out the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Seaway system. Our paper industry and our regional manufacturers receive raw materials over the Duluth Seaway Port Authority docks and uh, ship finished products from our warehouses. The power industry relies on our terminal and the Port of Duluth to move components such as transformers, generators, and wind turbine equipment for projects throughout the Midwest and up into Canada. Notably, both House File 1005 and Senate File 1090 from last year positioned TDAP with $28 million in funding. And the Minnesota Department of Transportation staff uh, in the freight program recommended to MMD this past fall that PDAP be funded at 28 million. Unfortunately, the governor's uh, budget doesn't match this, it's at 5 million, and, um, uh, and we think that's a big mistake. Aggressive funding for port infrastructure, especially at this point in time, makes, it, it makes a lot of sense for several reasons. First of all, PDAP funds leverage federal infrastructure funding in the form of competitive port infrastructure grants. The Infrastructure uh, Investment and Jobs Act more than doubles the uh, Maritime Administration's Port Infrastructure Development Program grant program. This is a program that's specific to ports and it was introduced two years ago, um, or it, it, it was the, the first time it was granted was two years ago. They've increased that amount to nearly $4 billion over the next five years. Just yesterday, Marriott announced a notice of funding opportunity for $450 million in PIDP grants, with another cycle possible this year, depending on when the, when the budget passes. Both the Duluth Seaway Port Authority and the St. Paul Port Authority have received port infrastructure development program grants from the Marriott in the past two years. And in both cases, the state PDAP funds were absolutely critical to enable, to enable both port authorities to demonstrate the required match for these grants. In fact, um, it's the Duluth Seaway Port Authority's experience from 2015 to 2020, so looking at completed projects, that each dollar in PDAP funding leveraged $2.70 in federal funds. These infrastructure projects are really expensive. Much of our port infrastructure throughout the state and throughout the Great Lakes um, is over 50 years old and even over 100 years old, well past its effective life. Uh, and this need is not going away. The Minnesota Port Association Port Authorities have identified over $125 million in future infrastructure projects beyond the $28 million in the current house file. Um, second reason, that was reason one. Uh, second reason is global freight demand is projected to triple between 2020 and 2050. Um, we need, and while we seek to bring down greenhouse gas emissions and address climate change while this freight demand is growing, we should be emphasizing the use of our waterways as the most energy efficient mode of freight transportation. Um, thirdly, global supply chains are strained from the pandemic and these disruptions, we've seen them at the coastal ports most, most notably, these disruptions translate directly to opportunities for Minnesota to strengthen our national supply chains. Um, infrastructure investments enable Minnesota's ports to be creative and nimble in providing supply chain solutions. Uh, and then fourth, as port cities, we need to be alert to the need to increase resilience in the face of, incre of the increasing frequency and intensity of storms. Um, the infrastructure we build with these grants is forward-looking and designed to improve resiliency. So Mr. Chair and members, Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about the PDAP program and our funding request for 2022. And thank you for your support. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, uh, President DeLuca. Members, any questions? Uh, seeing none, thank you, President DeLuca, for joining us this morning. Uh, members, we'll be moving to uh, individual uh, bonding bills. Again, these will be heard on an informational basis only. And out of respect for everyone, uh, please limit your presentation to about six minutes as communicated to all of you. First up, we have uh, Representative Nash, House File 3113. Please proceed. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members. Um, House File 3113 is a request for the City of Cologne. Its wastewater treatment facility is uh, in need of upgrading. 
Uh, much like some of the other requests I brought to the commission or the committee, we are seeing massive growth in Carver County and a lot of our fixed infrastructure uh, is really struggling to keep up. And in the interest of time for your request, Mr. Chair, I have two testifiers from the city of Cologne, the mayor and the city administrator, and I would just like to give them the balance of my time so that they can uh, share the story better than I. You can hear me talk anytime, so we'll let them uh, let them do it for me. Thank you, Representative Nash. Uh, Mr. Mayor, please identify yourself and proceed. Thank you. Uh, this is Matt Leon, mayor of Cologne. Uh, thank you, Mr. Nash, uh, for the opportunity to do this. Uh, Cologne's current facility is over 25 years old and needs upgrades to meet permit standards and accommodate growth. Left unfunded, the city would require significant user rate increases, potential moratoriums on growth, and inability to meet treatment standards. <clears throat> the city has completed a wastewater facility plan and submitted to the MPCA. The city also continues to optimize the operation of the treatment facility. The city started preliminary design work for the proposed improvements. The city has applied for the Clean Water Revolving Fund and Point Source Implementation Grant programs, and the city is on current, current intended use plan. The construction industry has been volatile in the last in the recent years with regards to material costs and lead times. The current total project price is estimated to be 12 to 15 million dollars. Uh, the infrastructure benefit to Cologne and Minnesota would be to protect our uh, Benton Lake and downstream waters of Minnesota River Basin, good stewards for the environment and maintain viability of a growing community. Uh, Jesse, do you have anything to add or? I, I would just add what we kind of talked about yesterday that, that the city of Cologne has been forward thinking on this. Uh, you know, we had a, a pretty big housing boom from about 17 through 2019, but we were already off and running with the inf influent infiltration plan in 2013, facility plan in 2015, and have been doing work since then by adding a new chemical feed to try to combat some of these phosphorus limits. So as much as we would like to move forward, you know, the funding is pretty necessary to do it in a timely manner to keep up with the new demand. Highway 212 being built out by the middle of next or this summer. To see a pretty huge uh, demand for both how hopefully commercial development that won't be able to happen without a wastewater treatment plant expansion. Uh, Mr. Dixon, can you identify yourself for the record before we proceed to members' question? Yes, sorry. Jesse Dixon, City Administrator, City of Cologne. Thank you. Representative Erdahl. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, uh, Mayor uh, and uh, Mr. Dixon. I uh, appreciate uh, mentioning PFA. Um, and I'm, I'm urging all of those who are testifying today, if you have a project that is eligible for PFA funding, uh, please let us know. Uh, if you have applied, and if you know the ranking that you have uh, with PFA, also let us know that. Uh, I guess I'm just throwing this out now so that we don't have to keep repeating this question as we go through this. Uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, do you know uh, what you are ranked in terms of PFA funding this year? Uh, Mr. Mayor or Mr. Dixon? We just, as of uh, the 2021 funding round, became into the fundable range. So we're I forget the exact number, but we're about right in the middle of the newly fundable projects. But we are on the list, and hopefully this year's round will put us into uh, projects that can be given uh, support and funding for the this round. Representative Erdahl. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Dixon, I appreciate knowing that, uh, that you are in the fundable range. And uh, as I indicated earlier, I appreciate uh, other uh, testifiers with other bills to also let us know that knowledge. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Erdahl. Uh, no other question, Representative Nash, any closing comments? Uh, Mr. Chair, thanks as always for having me in and to the commission or to the committee, as you consider the bill, please do consider this and the other fine projects coming out of Carver County. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Nash. Uh, next up, we're gonna change the agenda a little bit to accommodate our members and other committees. Uh, Representative Quam, House File 3318, please proceed. Uh, is Representative Kwam on, Ms. Nash? He was at one point, but he may have gone to check in um, to his other committee. 
Okay. Uh, if he's not on right now, why don't we uh, proceed with the agenda then? Uh, Representative Keogh, House File 2882, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, House File um, 2882 has to do with our flood damage projects that uh, we do to protect um, the Red River Valley and all the tributaries that enter into that as we uh, deal with spring flooding every year. Um, just a reminder to members, most people know this, but um, uh, the Red River flows north. So as we thaw in the spring, um, where the water heads is usually not thawed before it, uh, you know, and the southern part of the uh, Red River Valley is, is warmer. So we have some interesting uh, situation often, and uh, I don't believe we're going to have flooding, but we try to keep protection. Uh, it saves um, quite a bit of dollars if we can uh, keep from flooding um, both communities and um, actually ag land if we can help with that too. So, um, but it deals with quite a bit of Northwestern Minnesota. And um, I believe that Maury uh, is with me today and I'm going to ask that he introduce the bill, Maury Mahar, part of the watershed. Mr. Mahar, please identify yourself and proceed. Uh, hello, good morning, uh, Chair Lee and the uh, committee members. Thank you, uh, Ms. Kill and uh, the co-author on uh, this bill, 2882. Uh, yes, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to talk with you on the new Fulton project, flood, pre flood prevention project today. Uh, as uh, Ms. Kill mentioned, my name is Maury Maher. I'm the administrator of the Middle Snake Tamarack Rivers Watershed District. Uh, you may find my accent hard to follow, but I assure you will find my logic very easy to connect with. Uh, uh, <clears throat> let me see if I can share my screen. So um, that will be easier to... Okay. Do you see my screen now? Yes. yes please proceed. Okay. Um, well, uh, this is about the City of New Fulton Flood Prevention Project. Uh, who we are, we are the Middle Snake Tamarack Rivers Watershed District, uh, established in 1970, a local government unit operating in five different counties, Marshall, Polk, Pennington, Roseau, and Kitson, with majority in Marshall County. Uh, we are also a member of a bigger organization called Red River Watershed Management Board. You're familiar with that organization, I think. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, <clears throat> again, uh, in 2016, FEMA determined the parts of the city of New Folden in 100 year, year flood plain. Since then, we, we defined the project and passed through all the steps and processes and identified the best solution that has two components to it, an impoundment and a railroad bridge. Total project cost is $7.3 million. Uh, we are asking uh, for $4.8 million through the FHM Flood Hazard Mitigation Fund in the current bill of 20, 2882. The rest is covered uh, locally, which is $2.5 million. And uh, <clears throat> why the flood is important, flood control is important. Uh, I've, I've, I'm, I'm going to discuss just three uh, components to it, but it has so much more. Uh, so the economic impacts, Marshall County sits on two per, almost 2% of the Minnesota lands. However, it is in the top 11 percentile of the crop dollar generators in the whole United States. In, and this is according to the USDA 2017 report. So we need to safeguard this position and even cause to improve it to a higher rank if possible. We all know about the $7.3 billion infrastructure fund. I think that the committee received a presentation from the state budget director uh, earlier this month uh, on that uh, matter. The intent of that money is to improve roads, water, and wastewater systems. That is the right way to go. But uh, do you think that we need to ensure that investment somehow? I mean, we cannot we cannot repave roads and leave it to uh, the flood to wash it out altogether. So New Fulton Project and others like this in this bill 2882 uh, will safeguard this investment as well. And also another aspect, uh, economic aspect to it is the agri ag producers uh, will lose their whole year of effort if the water sits on their land for over 24 hours. 
this project and like and likewise other projects uh, will uh, safeguard uh, the downstream farms uh, in that aspect as well. Uh, in another note, the MPCA, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, has been giving us hints on losing our black gold, the topsoil, that is the dollar, dollar producer for us, due to the flood. This project and others like this will alleviate that effect as well. Well, it does have social impact as well. Uh, according to the government study called Minnesota Refined and Revisited in, uh, in a 15 year period from 2000 to 2015, we lost so many local residents due to the migration. Look at the chart. Uh, you see the, uh, the two left uh, columns kind of uh, going to the negative side. Uh, that, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not suggesting that flood is the only reason for the migrating people out of the, out of, out of the area but it can be one of the main reasons. I wouldn't, I wouldn't invest my whole life in an unsafe city. Immigration or immigrating out means loss of human resources and consequently uh, the loss of economy. Uh, I'm sure you use the trends analysis in your decision making. I use the state of rural 2021 update, which is, a created, which is created in affiliation with the University of Minnesota. And it has so many you know, different you know, parameters to look at. But, one of the very interesting one was 2% decline in the number of nonprofit entities in, is, is just one of many. So, and that is, that means uh, we have a problem and the problem is losing our social capital. This project and other projects like this have their environmental impacts uh, as well. Thankfully, our generation came to a point that we value environmentally sustainable projects. I'm not a professional in that area, but I believe the balance of the all environmental impacts of this project uh, is on the positive side as, as it provides like uh, better fish passage through the bridge on the middle river, water quality improvements, less sediment transfer and improvement of, on, of wetlands uh, in the vicinity of the project site area, just to call a few. Why now? Um, flood hazard is like a brake issue in our car. Uh, would you delay repairing that? I wouldn't. Uh, well, uh, you know what better than I do? In 2002, city of Roseau got flooded. That was a disaster. It ruined so many infrastructures, cost the federal, state, and locals tens of millions of dollars and to get the city back to the normal. The background photo, as you see in the, in the presentation file, uh, is from that event. We don't want that happen to the new folder. Uh, so uh, we now we know the problem. We designed the solution. So let's be proactive and implement it before it is too late. I know $4.8 million is a lot of money, but please don't forget there is a ROI rate of six to one, according to established you know, uh, studies. And uh, to be honest, I believe that this rate is even higher in our area. Again, uh, I thank you for the, for the time and the opportunity to propose our new Fulden project and the importance of it, and ask for your approval on the Representative Kills uh, Bill number 2882, and for your continuous assistance with the flood damage re reduction projects in our area. With that, I conclude my presentation and stand for questions or comments. Thanks again. Thank you, Mr. Mahar. Uh, members, any questions for Mr. Mahar or Representative Keel? Seeing none, Representative Keogh, any uh, quick closing comments? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, for you and the committee to hear this bill. I know we hear about flooding all the time. It's almost in every bonding bill. And I really appreciate the fact that we acknowledge that this is a challenge. But as Mr. Mahar said, um, the return on investment is so much better than should we have to deal with flooding and the issues and the loss of, of residents. So not to mention the ag land that is damaged or challenged by um, uh, crops uh, that, that grow in this area. So I thank you very much and um, would ask for you to support this uh, uh, House File 2882. Uh, thank you, Representative Keo, for your presentation. Next up, uh, let's try Representative Kwam again, House File 3318. Please proceed, Representative Kwam. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, this is another uh, flood mitigation bill. Um, it, it was bad in southern Minnesota. A few years we've had flooding and it's closed the uh, Highway 14. 
it's uh, caused backup of sewage into people's uh, you know basements and, and other issues. And there is a testifier that can get into uh, more details on that, but this is something that uh, government should address. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Representative Kwam. To the city administrator from the city, please identify yourself and proceed. Uh, Mr. Is it Ibish? Apologize if I got it wrong. I see you on here, but you may be speaking, and, but you're muted right now. Uh, Representative Quams, seems like your uh, presenter might not be on. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, I'm sorry about that. This Some people are not used to the Zoom and the uh, connectivity. Um, you know, with recent storms, we've had some issues with uh, internet down here. But uh, basically, there have been uh, repeated uh, flood issues. And this is to uh, try to address so that we don't have, you know, again, sewage backed up into basements, uh, streets and homes flooded. And also, we've had to, as I said, shut down. Uh, part of uh, Highway 14, a main artery uh, in southern Minnesota. And this would address all those issues and, uh, you know, again, take care of uh, something I think government is, is very um, responsible to try and, and assist our communities. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Kwam. Members, do we have any questions for Representative Kwam, House File 3318? A scene on thank you, Representative Kwam, for joining us. Next up, we have a Representative Keeler, House File 1414. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, House File 1414 is another flood mitigation ask. Um, I want to kind of set the landscape of what my community looks like. Uh, we partner um, right up against Fargo, and so the Red River sits between us. Um, why this is so important is because the time is now to make this investment. Um, we know from the data that we've looked at out of our top 10 floods in history, eight of them happened in the last 30 years. Um, we also know that with climate change, increased flooding is a reality. Um, and you can look outside in my community and see we're sitting with a ton of snow. Um, our thaw is different and we have no idea what the spring rain is gonna bring. Um, for my community, uh, we need access to Fargo. That's where our hospitals are. That's where our closest medical care is. Um, like many communities, the population that lives along the river is a vulnerable population. Um, we can sit here and ask for pieces of this, but I'm gonna be bold and say, we really need to invest in the 17.5 million. Um, we're coming to the table with other players. Uh, Fargo, North Dakota, federal money, um, county money is invested in this. Um, and this is the last ask. I know many of you traveled out to my community and probably enjoyed a dilly bar um, in between the visits that you had in my community. Um, but from an equity lens and from an inclusive lens, um, I believe that we really need to invest in this. And similar to what Representative Keel said, uh, we sit along the same river and we're connected. So investing in flood mitigation in my community actually helps other communities in our state as well. Um, I'm gonna yield the rest of my time to Lisa Bodie from Moorhead City. Ms. Bodie, uh, please identify yourself and proceed. Thank you, Chair Lee. I'm Lisa Bodie. I'm the Governmental Affairs Director for the City of Moorhead. And I thank you all for uh, inviting us to testify today. And thanks to Representative Keeler for sponsoring and advocating uh, for Moorhead's flood protection. The commitment by the state of Minnesota to address Red River flooding in Moorhead has been substantial. And it's to address a very substantial problem as Representative Keeler indicated, and we're doing it in a comprehensive way. The city, the legislature and the DNR have been working on this issue for 13 years. We need 17 and a half million to complete this work and we can see the finish line. The remaining work is needed for Moorhead's in-town flood protection and it is also necessary for completion of the $2.7 billion FM diversion project, which is funded primarily by the federal government, the city of Fargo, Cass County, and the state of North Dakota. 
There are just five elements of the 2009 flood plan to complete. The projects are listed in our briefing materials, which I believe you received yesterday, um, and they're in priority order. The top three are particularly time sensitive. The North Moorhead Project Phase 2 is necessary to complete protection of a residential area in North Moorhead that was just annexed to the city in 2015. So this is the area where the bonding tour visited last summer besides the Dairy Queen. And the sanitary lift station number two in downtown Moorhead must be relocated out of the floodplain as it cannot be protected at its current location. This is one of the last sandbagging projects that we have to do. We have to protect that infrastructure at a pretty low flood level. The lift station is in the downtown area of Moorhead Center Mall, which is anticipated to begin a long awaited redevelopment in 2023. If funding is approved this session, this project could be bid in time to be coordinated with the downtown plan uh, redevelopment. And along that same line, the First Avenue North flood wall is also in downtown and important to public safety, commercial investment and economic growth of our community. During flood events, all roads leading to the Yumkamp Center in Moorhead's downtown area and the First Avenue North bridge to Fargo are inundated with flood water. An alternative access route was constructed in 2010, but fire trucks aren't able to use that route. So this area is not adequately protected during, if there were a fire during a major flood event. And the fourth project we have is stormwater lift stations, which includes upgrades to automate our existing flood control pumping stations to electric pumps, which are now manually operated tractor driven gas or diesel pumps. The Riverview Circle Levy and 40th Avenue South Road Raise is the final project, and that would allow 190 parcels and 30 existing structures in this area to be removed from the floodplains by means of the levy protection. Um, so this summarizes the city's request. Flooding is a long time problem for Moorhead, and we are eager to put it behind us with your help. So thanks for your time and we would be happy to answer any questions, Mr. Chair. I will note that the, the flooding projects are not eligible for PFA funding. So thank, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bodie. Uh, members, do we have any questions for Representative Keeler or Ms. Bodie? Uh, seeing none, Representative Keeler, any uh, closing remarks? Thank you for visiting my community and taking this into consideration. Um, we really could use this 13 years is a long time to keep asking. Um, I think our community would like to move forward to some other um, opportunities as well in the future. Um, cost of doing this is only going to increase um, and the need is always going to be here. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Representative uh, Keeler. Next up, we have Chair Eklund. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, uh, House file. I don't have the number in front of me. I apologize. The bill I have today is for the Net Lake Band, uh, the dam for the at the Net Lake Band in uh, Cuchitin County. It's for three million dollars to reconstruct uh, and repair the dam at Net Lake. And with me today, Mr. Chair, is I have Chairwoman Shavers of the boy, uh, from Boys Fort and uh, Net Lake, and she will explain the details of what why this dam is needed and this money is needed. Um, the last time it was repaired was, it fixed was uh, somewhere back in the 1980s. So it's been about 40 years, Mr. Chair. With that, I'll turn it over to my testifier. Thank you, uh, Chair Eklund. So the House file members, House file 2938. Uh, welcome to the committee, Chair Chavers. Please identify yourself and proceed. Jim Higwitz, Chairman and Committee Members for hearing me today. My name is Kathy Chavers. I am the Tribal Chairwoman of the Boys Fort Band of uh, Chippewa. Uh, we're located 50 miles from the Canadian border and uh, we're in northern Minnesota. We also operate and uh, maintain Fortune Bay Resort and Casino on Lake Vermilion and Tower, Minnesota. Um, I'm very honored to be before you today to testify and talk about uh, an issue that is extremely um, dear to our hearts here at Boys Fort and that's our control dam that is uh, uh, currently uh, in disrepair uh, because it's just, it's, it's failing. Um, this fall, we had to put an emergency berm in uh, because our dam, uh, which was constructed in 1987 uh, by the state, um, has had uh, 
numerous issues. First, the weir gates that we have are extremely heavy, uh, 10,000 pounds a piece, but the, the ice that builds up in the winter, um, because it's a concrete dam, and we know what happens with concrete and ice, um, it just erodes it away. And so um, at first we had a log, a uh, stop log uh, dam, but I think when they put in the dam with the concrete, they didn't understand the problems that uh, uh, are contributing to uh, the ice issues that we face. Um, the other thing is that our fish ladder on our dam has also failed. And we had a fish study done um, with the approval of our elders here at Boys Fork because our, our river, I mean, our river and our lakes and, and whatever are very important to us. And we have to get elder approval for anything that we do with our lake. We don't allow um, any boats, any motorized boats on our lake because our wild rice is very precious to us. Our wild rice is an economic um has economic impact for our tribal members, but also it also um, provides uh, um, ducks to come into our lake. They love to eat our rice. And so uh, we have uh, tribal members that harvest the rice, sell the rice, and we also do that as a tribe ourselves. But we also uh, take uh, hunters on our lake, and we have guides that uh, have their own little businesses to do that. And so with this dam, because it's failing, um, if the water goes through, it will wipe out a rice crop. And um, this dam has had a hard, hard life here. And right now, uh, we don't have or cannot locate any funding to help replace this dam. And that's why we're before you today. This is one of the highest priorities of our band right now. And we don't trust the dam will last any longer, and it needs to be replaced. Um, the one thing that we did look was at the tribe did go and research rock arch dams, and that's what we're looking at to replace this dam with. And rock arch dams are more environmentally friendly, and it allows fish, fish passage, water passage, and animal, and animal passage. Um, currently, our, our dam does not allow that. Um, it is an economically and ecologically practical structure. Um, construction of the new dam will have a positive impact on the fish and wildlife, of the lake and preserve wild race beds for the future. And so um, what I just like to say is that um, our, our rice is the best rice in the world. I'm gonna say that, I've said that to all the tribal members, uh, all the tribal nations in the state, um, but Net Lake is known for its wild rice. And our lake is the only lake that we have to produce this rice. And so with that, um, you know, we really um, uh, need, to replace this and how we're going to do that is we need to replace the road to go to the that goes to the dam we need to remove the dam the structure we need to put in the, the huge rocks for the rock arch dam so it is going to be a um, very big undertaking for us and uh, but it's well well worth the dollars um, because the outcome of it um, brings us food brings us sustenance brings us uh, economic um, uh, abilities for our tribal members uh, who process and, and harvest the rice. And um, it's going to require a lot of uh, construction to be done. And that's why we put the berm in because, um, you know, I've heard the flood mitigation stuff, but up in northern Minnesota, we had, uh, we had such a drought here that we really didn't realize the damage to the dam until uh, the water levels went so low on our river. Um, that we could actually see the damage that was done to our to our dam, which in a in a good way that we're glad that for that. Um, but for our rice to grow, we need to control the levels of the lake. So I really am very honored today to talk to all of you um, today and, and appreciate you willing to listen to me um, regarding our huge issue here at Boys Fort. Miigwech. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair Chavers. A uh, track, Lindsay, no uh, questions, any closing comments? Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Chair Shavers, for testifying. Uh, I really appreciate it. And I, it, this is something that's really needed for the, for the Boys Fort Band, and I invite anybody to come up and view and take a look in that lake. It is just an amazing, amazing uh, water body, and, and the, rice, <laughs> the rice it produces is the best in the world. So thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Thank you, Chair Eklund. Next up, we have Representative Grunhagen, House File 2797. Please proceed. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, members, for giving us the opportunity to present. 
these bonding requests. There's two for it's for two small cities. Uh, the first one is for New Auburn, and uh, it's a total project cost of $12 million. They're requesting $6 million in bonding. It's for a new water treatment facility. Uh, new Auburn has a beautiful lake, and so there are some NP MPCA permit uh, compliances also involved with this. Uh, in addition to that, they, they have a very small commercial base as far as taxation is concerned. I have two testifiers. The first one's Justin Black. He's the project mes uh, manager. And then Kurt Reese. He's the water operations director. They should be on the uh, on the Zoom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Guhagen. Mr. Reitz or Mr. Black, please identify yourself and proceed. Well, my name is Kurt Reitz. I'm a, uh, a water, water wastewater operator for the past 42 years. I have my own business. I do uh, small operations and training and mentoring for small communities. Um, currently, I'm working, one of my projects is the city of New Auburn, and I'll briefly go over our slides and we'll get out of here in less than our six minutes. Um, <laughs> as, as you can see there, uh, first of all, thank you, Representative Gruhagen, for sponsoring the bill. And I'm sorry I didn't address the chair and members, but we thank, thank you for our time. Um, we're going to, we're looking at major improvements to our wastewater ponds for irrigation and sanitary sewage systems. Our wastewater ponds were put in back in the 70s. The city has put substantial money into uh, rehabilitating the ponds. Uh, we do spray irrigation. The city owns about 40 acres of land. They've upgraded the land and the dray tile system. They, we've put in uh, uh, additional spray irrigation equipment. Uh, and in town, in our collection, system they've done uh, a lot of inflow infiltration or INI studies and uh, 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 projects to clear up issues they put substantial money in the lift station to keep it running for the past 40 years I think in about the past eight years we've invested between 25 and 35 thousand dollars in pumps and controls we're also looking at storm sewer additions we're next to uh, a lake so uh, we have relatively high groundwater so we really can't put in an overall comprehensive storm sewer system because uh, it, that wouldn't really benefit the environment too much by draining everything into the lake quick, but we still have to make some modifications to our storm sewer system. We're also looking at some slight water improvement uh, for water quality, water flow and fire protection and water metering for uh, water accountability. Next slide, please. Uh, our treatment ponds are aids, as I said, and are undersized for current flows. Uh, during wet periods, uh, like not too bad now, but uh, coming in here in the next months, we're going to be worried about whether our ponds are going to be overtopping the dikes because we can't start spraying until the ground is thawed <coughs> until our permit states uh, uh, in April. Our spray irrigation field is often overloaded in violation with our current permit. We're allowed a, a certain amount of gallons per year in our spray application cycles. And we currently go over that probably two out of five years. We do best management practices and we manage the wastewater spray system as good as we can, but we still go over our NPDES permit. Cost evaluations to connect to another city have uh, shown 20 to 25% higher costs and higher operation and maintenance costs. One of the things our engineering team wanted to do was look at other communities and see what it would cost to possibly tie in with another city or do regionalization. Um, and it does look to be higher, both again, because of construction costs and maintenance costs. And then basically we would become a customer of that city or that regional system and, and the city itself, New Auburn, would pay sewer rate fees. Our main lift station and force maintenance to our treatment pond is severely aged and deteriorating. As I said, it's, it's in jeopardy of failure but we've put a lot of money into it. And we're gonna to continue to maintain it and continue to do as much as we can to uh, alleviate problems. We have leaking sanitary sewer manholes and sewer lines allowing I and I inflow and infiltration as many communities do in our state. But this uh, allows extra water to get into our sanitary sewer system, uh, which causes lift station capacity issues and bypass issues during rain events. And bypass issues, of course, with the lake being adjacent to our city, affect the lake. We also have some collapsing sewer lines, sags contributing to raw sewage bypass vents. Our storm sewer improvements, like I said, are not uh, uh, over entailing the whole community, but we do have uh, storm sewer improvements that we're looking to replace some 
failing collapsing storm tiles. We've got undersized piles. We want to alleviate some of the floodings in the yards. Again, our water main uh, improvements are for looping and additional fire protection. And we'd love to put in additional water meters and new water meters for uh, better meter accuracy and water accountability. We're looking at about $12 million. We're, we're hoping to get $6 million on the bonding request. We've been in constant contact with the USDA of, of which we're hoping to get some possible grants through them and the rest will be PFA funding, which is gonna be absorbed through city water and sewer rates and tax rates. We think that that uh, PF funding or the city rates is gonna probably be about 20 to 25% of the project or about two and a half to $3 million. So that uh, is, a, is a projection of what the city is gonna have in this game. Uh, and we are working on a preliminary engineering report and our city is ready to uh, submit that, our engineering firm is ready to submit that fairly soon. We aren't currently on the priority ranking list, but our application should be going in and we're looking to get on the ranking list for 2023. Uh, as you can see the possible, possible outcomes, I won't go, everything, go through everything, but uh, our wastewater ponds and our spray irrigation capacity could uh, make it into the future stop permit violations and bypasses, uh, of course, preserve the lake, increase our lift station capacity. The big one is NPDS, uh, our MPCA permit compliance. We wanna stay in compliance with that and be on the good side of the state and MPCA. Uh, as far as the water mains, we want better fire protection and drinking water quality. And oh, with, the water and meters, with the water meters, we want uh, uh, better usage accountability. That I'll end our, our talk. If any of the members have any questions or comments, we would feel free. Otherwise, we thank uh, Representative Gruhagen for including us on the bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Zaski. Seeing no questions, uh, Representative Gruhagen, any quick closing comments? No, I, you know, when I look at bonding issues, I look at need, want, and desire. And this is definitely a need. And I uh, would ask the committee to seriously consider it. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Gruhagen. Next up on the agenda is Representative Kreshaw, House File 2884. Please proceed. Mr. Chair, I do have a second request in there uh, with Silver Lake uh, that I'd just like to present quickly. Was that included in the uh, House File 2797 too then? Yes. Uh, well, yeah, why don't, uh, why don't you go ahead? Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, committee members. Yeah, the next request I have is from Silver Lake. It's a small community without a, lar uh, a large commercial base either. It is number eight as far as the PFA is concerned, and it's a $30 million project with a uh, $15 million bonding request from the state. I do have a testifier, uh, Josh Winfrey. He's on the uh, Silver Lake City Council. Uh, Mayor Bebo uh, wanted to be here, but unfortunately he had a prior commitment. So with that, uh, Mr. Winfrey is available for testifying on this. Uh, please identify yourself, Mr. Winfrey, and proceed. I'm Josh Winfrey with Silver Lake City Council, and with me I have uh, John Rodenberg from uh, SEH. He's our city engineer. Um, I'm going to get right into this right away. I've been told I'm long-winded, so I'll try to go as fast as I can. Um, we are in desperate need of a total reconstruction of our sanitary sewer um, and water supply system. Um, most of our infrastructure is, is over 100 years old, um, and, and much of it is old segmented uh, field tiles from when a lot of this was agricultural land, and, and you have issues with roots growing in um, with, with frost heaves, separating joints, um, with washouts. It just wasn't designed for what it's being used for. Um, our water tower is of inadequate size and needs update. Um, it, it's hard to expand the town when we don't have the ability to do that from the size of our water tower. Um, we can't even handle fire suppression systems if a business wants to come in. Um, that's well over 100 years old. Um, we would need a water treatment facility um, to have the quality of water that people should be drinking as we've seen in Flint, Michigan. And I'm not gonna say it's that bad, but it's the bedrock of every community to have good quality water. We have such a high amount of iron and manganese in our system that the water is often rusty and cloudy. Um, I've seen bathtubs uh, full of water that looks like tomato juice at times. Um, our water wastewater treatment ponds um, need expansion and update. Right now we're having an issue, um, like many people are in small towns um, 
with so much water infiltration into our sewer system that we're out of compliance often with the MPCA um, because of our rate of flow. And you can see this often with, um, with really rainy seasons, you see it that we have so much water coming into our sewer systems that it's just overflowing our ponds. Um, and, and we need an entire street rebuild due to complete um, infrastructure under the streets. And, and there again, with the with these sewer systems, we're seeing when we get these blockages and backing up into people's basements where where, where their children play. And um, a lot of people before the digital age maybe keep their, their family photos. Um, and we've got sewer backing up into them because of these blockages. You're also seeing washouts in our streets now. And this is happening often. And we're in a low, low lying area too because we have a lake next to us. Um, so why are infrastructure improvements needed? Well, there again, the sanitary sewer system and water supplies uh, have major deficiencies. Um, with the old concrete field tiles and the water infiltration, um, the infrastructure is over 100 years old. The INI, we've invested a lot in the INI already um, with that water infiltration to the system, and it's just still coming. And you can really, really see it on our charts, um, especially in rainy seasons. It's just, it, it's so much, it's overwhelming. Um, and uh, we have, there again, capacity issues and fire control uh, system issues with the amount of water um, coming from our tower. Um, uh, I think I've covered the reconstruction of seats, streets. So you can see on some of these, you can see some of the joints and, and some of these photos here where we do have the roots growing in. We've, we've been, uh, um, and you can see the offset joints and, and uh, we, we televise our, our systems a lot and we're just seeing it worse and worse every year. Um, so potential funding um, and, and project phasing, this, the street and utility projects, um, is $10 million. The overall project is an estimated $30 million. I mean, we, we, we've we reached our expiration date uh, on this system. Um, and, and the wastewater at 2.7, the water at 3 million, um, storm at 2.7. And, and the thing with the storm sewers is a lot of this used to be sanitary sewer. We're just stretching it as far as we can. We went from that being sanitary to now we're using it for storm um, because we're a small town community and, and um, we're invested in this obviously, but with it being such a low-lying area and, and it being former sanitary sewers are now our storm sewers, they're so far undersized. They just can't handle the rate of flow, the volume trying to get through these, and they're blowing out uh, our, our undersized manholes, which um, also don't collect water well because they're the really old ones, and it's flooding people's yards, it's flooding their basements, and we've had this problem for decades. Um, our lift stations, we, we're, we're having constant issues with those because they're are beyond outdated and in fact we just addressed one recently um so there's nine uh nine million there uh five million for lining some of these because we're trying to save where we can uh don't rip out streets that we don't have to and try to line them um sorry trying to rush this as fast as i can um and we covered water uh uh, capacity there uh, for wastewater. So the total project looking at 30 million now funding package, rural development grants um, have been applied for, um, rural development loans uh, for remaining eligible costs and that's spread over 39 years. And we're, we're looking for a 50-50 here. The, the city share loans um, and payments assessments is, is one route we've looked for the city's uh, share, general obligation bonds um, through taxes and, and there again, we have a small commercial base as far as taxes, um, utility fees, which we've we've got them up to where they need to be, um, and rural development uh, community uh, facility loans uh, can cover cover some of the ineligible uh, street costs, state bonding requests um, submitted, and on the on the PPL list, like I said, we are number eight um, because of our extensive needs, I think, and and uh, so positive outcomes from it. We're rebuilding and modernizing a hundred year old infrastructure. I mean, this is, like I said, it's reached this expiration date and we've put as many band-aids on as we can um, solve those I and I issues, um, we, which can get us back in compliance um, with the MPCA, which I believe we are right now, but it, it comes and goes with, with uh, rainy seasons and um, the drinking water. We can meet compliance standards because um, uh, you know, we exceed uh, secondary standards there. Um, and, uh, and water tower will be sized correctly for fire protection. Um, so we can put these systems in buildings, uh, normalized pressure for residential and business capacity, uh, wastewater treatment capacity sized right and meet future MPC re uh, CA regulations and allow for future housing and business expansions. We simply can't expand our town and we don't wanna fade away. You know, we, we'll get ran over by everybody around us because we simply can't. Uncle Member, can I have you wrap up please? 
Okay, um, I think that's about all I have. And there again, I just want to thank Representative Grunhagen. Thank you so much for this opportunity. The entire community thanks you. Um, and thank this committee for giving us the opportunity to speak with you. We really appreciate it. Thank you, uh, Representative Grunhagen. Any quick closing comments? No, thank you. And thanks for the opportunity to present these two needs and thanks for your consideration. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Representative Creeshaw, House File 2884. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, I should have my testifiers with me, the mayor of the city. And if she's here, I'd like to turn that over to the mayor. Uh, Madam Mayor, please proceed. Sandy Lang, I am the mayor of the city of Swanville for the last 16 years. We're a small town of uh, 350, 340 people south or north of St. Cloud. I'm very proud of our community and what we have supported and accomplished over the years. Our community provides great quality of life for our residents, including beautiful park, a walking trail, a K through 12 school system, and a number of local small communities or businesses. Some very special people have graduated from our local high school, including Milo Thompson, a Minneapolis architect, Kyle Loven, an FBI agent, Janine Holig, a Minneapolis chef, and then there has been many teachers, business owners, farmers, and other successful people who have currently called Swanville uh, home. Swanville supports 15 businesses, including a bank, uh, grocery store, hardware store, lumber yard, cafe, several gas stations, and a feed mill. We have about 165 homes and three apartment buildings. Our community has grown. We built a new street and created eight new lots in 2019. All eight lots have been sold and homes were built, including one for Habitat of Humanity to support uh, low-income families. All these characteristics make Swanville a beautiful place to live, work and play and raise a family. Our city's mission is to provide safe, clean water and other quality utilities to our residents, but we will not be able to do this without some funding assistance from you. Swanville is faced with the need to replace some of our critical components of our water system infrastructure. Most notable, our water tower and primary well are both over 90 years old. The age and condition of the water tower triggered a Minnesota Department of Health violation two years ago. And the primary water supply well is showing increased signs of chloride contamination. Both of these items pose a significant risk to our public health. Replacement of this infrastructure is very expensive and will result in a significant amount of debt burden to our small city. Although the city has many amenities to, our, to offer new residents, its ability to accommodate new housing and other development with the necessary infrastructure may be limited due to our long-term debt from the water tower and well project. Additionally, the city will eventually be faced with substantial upgrades to our sewer system and the rehabilitation of our aged roadways, which again will be very difficult to resolve with a significant long-term debt from this project. In an effort to, to stop some of this long-term debt and help our community, we have applied for the PFA, USD, UDSA, Royal Development and Small Cities Development Programs. However, we are well aware of the limitations of these programs. As such, we are seeking additional assistance from the Capital Investment Committee to mitigate our potential long-term debt so that we can continue to provide a great quality of life for our residents now and in the future. Uh, I'll turn this over to our city engineer now. Thank you. Uh, to clarify a few things, the city has made is on the project priority list for their water infrastructure system. Uh, they rank 26 uh, for their new wells and they have rankings of 295 and 296 for their um, meters and distribution system. Uh, the city was referred from the project priority list from PFA to rural development. Um, a PER has been written and application has been made to a rural development as well um, as also as well as small cities uh, development program through deed uh, so we were um, eligible to do the full application for deed and we're awaiting funding results from those programs as well so we'd open it up if you have any questions uh can you identify yourself for the record please uh tyson high with more engineering thank you mr high check uh, seeing no questions representative creeshaw any uh, closing comments no, I just want to thank the committee for their time. I appreciate giving us a couple minutes and look forward to how this project can move along. Thank you, Representative Kreisha. Next up, we have Representative Sand State, uh, House File 203284. Please proceed. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to join you today. 
Proposed file 3284 would invest 2.5 million in a PFA grant for the city of Floodwood's water and sewer infrastructure. Floodwood is a small community in St. Louis County with a population of just 449. In 2020's bonding bill, we were able to help Floodwood out with an investment in their wastewater treatment ponds, which were failing and putting residents' health in jeopardy. Now the city is looking to extend water and sewer mains along the necessary, along with necessary street construction along County Road 8, US Highway 2, and State Highway 73 to serve new residents and businesses along these major roadways in the city. Many existing residents have um, substandard and failing septic systems and they deserve water quality and sewer services. Floodwood is an extremely poor property tax community which limits the city's ability to make significant infrastructure investments. To grow their tax base, they need to attract new residential development and commercial and retail activity. To realize this vision, the city needs a reliable modern infrastructure. Failing to keep up with this um, is really not an option. Uh, today, I have with me former mayor of Floodwood, Dave Denoyer, to talk about this issue. Mr. Denoya, please identify yourself and proceed. Thank you, Chair Lee and Vice Chair Murphy, committee members, for the opportunity to present our project. My name is Dave Denoyer. I'm a former mayor. I'm representing Mayor Kat Farrell on the City Council. Mayor Farrell is home quarantining this week and uh, unable to attend this. The City of Flood was requesting $2.5 million of a $5 million project for the design, replacement, and expansion of water sewer infrastructure along County Highway 8, US Highway 2, and State Highway 73. All three of these highway areas will provide sewer and water. The area along Highway 8 will provide needed access to residents with substandard and failing systems. The State Highway 73 will expand sewer and water 1.2 miles to a new housing development and serve existing residents and businesses along the way. Highway 2 will be expanded to serve residents and commercial businesses. It's very important for the City of Floodwood to undertake infrastructure expansions that will help enhance residential development and increase commercial and retail activity. Due to our geographic location, Floodwood serves as a regional hub we have two major highways, one being US Highway 2 and the other State Highway 73, which is a uh, direct route from the I-35 corridor, corridor to the Iron Range. Um, we serve as a regional hub for the uh, MnDOT truck stations, the DNR Forestry, St. Louis County Public Works, Arrowhead Transit, to, to show what a remote location, but a regional hub we serve. Um, the Floodwood Ambulance District serves 320 square miles here. Our school district is 317 square miles. The fire department covers 288 square miles. Floodwood Services and Training, which pro provides uh, people who are struggling with physical and mental challenges encompasses an area that extends with a 40 mile radius of Floodwood. Floodwood is also home for a mental and dental clinic that serves underserved patients in Northeast Minnesota. Our medium household income is only 33,274 compared to St. Louis County's 53,344. Um, and the state medium income is 74,593, just to show the, the uh, medium income of the people in this area. Floodwood's low to moderate income percentage that has, that has designated this community is 70.21%. Also, our tax base is much smaller than larger communities that surround Floodwood and increasing property taxes has a huge impact on residents and businesses. A substantial amount of the property within the city of Floodwood is tax exempt property. The project is the number one 
priority for the city of Floodwood. Lack of sewer and water services is affecting the ability for new families to move into the area, as well as any new businesses to expand, and it does not allow for any new business to build in these locations. Lack of sewer and water also affects our school dis district. It's just difficult for people to move in, as well as teachers to find suitable housing. They often travel for over 40 miles one way just to find housing to teach in our district. But without proper water sewer uh, hookups, our housing needs will never be accomplished. So again, the city is asking for 2.5 million of a $5 million project. The city would provide 2.5 million and local match through loans, bonds, and other resources. Without state bonding funds for the city, we would not be able to undertake this project. This is mostly new construction and it does not meet the PFA ranking list, the criteria for their ranking. And we want to thank you for your time and consideration of our project and we're open to any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. DeNora. Uh, Chair Murphy. Mr. Chair, Mr. Denier, um, you spoke at the Masaba College um, in the fall, and you said something about two rivers going through Floodwood. Could you clarify uh, that for me? Mr. Yes, uh, Chair, uh, Chair Lee and Vice Chair Murphy and many members, we actually have three rivers within the city of Floodwood. This is kind of hurts our development because we have floodplains and wetlands next to these rivers. So we have to expand out, expand out. And um, so, so, so it's really difficult because of our geographic location with these rivers. Okay. So there, are three. there so are three. There are three rivers? Correct. Thank you. I see no other question. Uh, Representative Sensta, any quick closing comments? Thank you for hearing the bill, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you. Representative Igo, House File 3094. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, my, my bill, uh, House File 3094, is for a water treatment project for the city of Grand Rapids. So it's going to be asking for $2.5 million, million in bonding to upgrade the facility there in Grand Rapids that serves also uh, the community of La Prairie uh, and the community college and U of M extension. So the facility is 34 years old, uh, and due to uh, the, uh, the expansion that's occurring in Grand Rapids um, and the need to upgrade the facility, this bonding project would help to keep rates low uh, in the city of Grand Rapids as to not affect uh, the citizens. So uh, with me today is uh, Julie Kennedy, who is the general manager of the Grand Rapids PUC, and I'll have her introduce herself and kind of give a quick rundown on the project. Uh, Ms. Kennedy, please identify yourself and proceed. Thank you, Chair Lee and Representative Igo. This is Julie Kennedy, General Manager with Grand Rapids Public Utilities. Thank you for hearing our uh, testimony today. Again, as Representative Igo mentioned, this um, existing water plant is a wonderfully simple plant. It treats the cities of Grand Rapids and La Prairie. Um, it, we test or treat groundwater from two very clean aquifers here, and minimal treatment is needed. We're one of only a handful of plants um, throughout the state that do not require chlorination, and our customers certainly love that. Um, but our preliminary engineering uh, has deemed that we, we need to make some improvements to those components. Our building, however, does not need improvement, and that keeps our costs down to about $5 million. Um, and so with that, those components that need to be um, upgraded are our filters and our pumps and our lighting, things that over the course of 34 years have drastically improved in energy efficiency. In addition to that, our security needs to be ramped up to meet the federal OEA requirements that we're seeing here uh, in this last year. Uh, when we did uh, build that first plant, we used funds ourselves. Um, we used our reserves and uh, local geo bonds. And we could do that and stretch our, our improvement over the next five to 10 years. But the problem with that is the Greater Grand Rapids community is really thriving right now with economic development. And so we need to accelerate those improvements to support our growing rural community. And in order to do that, we need that state funding to help keep those customer rates low, as we had talked about. About 35% of our customers are lower than um, the state average as far as household median income. 
Um, we did not submit to the PFA for this project. Our larger projects, like our $30 million wastewater project, we do work with the PFA. This project down at about $5 million, we feel it's more administratively efficient to work with our GO and, and revenue bonds at the city ourselves. And so again, thank you, Representative Lee. We thank you for hearing about our project and considering our request. One last thing before I turn it over to Representative Igo. Way to go, Thunderhawks, in their victory over Duluthies last night. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Kennedy. Uh, members, do we have any questions for Representative Igo or Ms. Kennedy? Uh, seeing none, uh, Representative Igo, any closing comments? Yeah, uh, thank you again, Mr. Chair and members for listening to our request today. Um, again, this is just a vital project to keeping Greater Minnesota thriving and our communities alive and well. So thank you for your consideration and I'll reiterate what Julie said, Bill Thunderhawks. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Igo. Next up, we have Representative Lipper, House File 3459. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Last year, uh, the authorized, legislature authorized the establishment of the Water Quality and Storage Program with a one-time funding allocation of $2 million. The Board of Soil and uh, Water and Soil Resources has developed the program guidelines and the first round of grant applications has been advertised with project proposals due April 4th. This bill would provide an additional $5 million in bonding to fund projects for the next two years. And the purpose of water storage is to slow the rate of runoff to rivers by storing water on the land and reducing overall runoff volume by allowing, allowing water to soak into the ground. The proposed practices must document the amount of flow reduction they'll, they'll achieve. And this program focuses on two well-known problem areas, the Minnesota River watershed and tributaries to the Mississippi in Southeastern Minnesota. I live in Northfield and the Cannon River winds through our community. We've had 100 to 500 year floods in 2010, 2012, 2013, 2014, and 2016. We have very high flows every spring and now nearly every fall. We know more floodings on the way due to the extreme rains due by, caused by climate change and what will help the most and uh, help other communities too are water storage projects like this bill would fund that can hold water back on the landscape and slow the flow of water. In the Minnesota watershed, 80 acres a year are lost to channel widening, bluff collapse, and ravine growth. Along the entire river length, flashy flows widen and deepen rivers, damaging infrastructures like roads and bridges. Downstream, eroded sediment clouds the water, impairs river habitat, clogs navigation channels, and buries or compromises infrastructure like levees, trails and roads, and, and even communities. Water storage projects are different from flood control structures, which target the very highest flows. Those are still needed, but don't address the more frequent channel forming flows that are targeted with this new program. Water storage is especially important now because Minnesotans, Minnesota is receiving larger individual rain events. And for each rain event, a greater portion of it runs off because less water is held in plant roots and leaves. Less water soaks in due to decreased soil health, wetland loss, tiling, and impermeable surfaces. Communities, individuals, and agribusiness leaders in the Minnesota Basin are uh, supported the passage of the Water Storage Initiative. And right now, the Lesseur, Greater Blue Earth, Root, and Zumbro watersheds are all well studied, and the time to implement the solutions is right now. To say more about this bonding proposal is Dr. Kerry Jennings of Freshwater. Thank you, thank Representative you. Lipper. Uh, Dr. Jennings, please identify yourself and proceed. Mr. Chair, members, thank you, um, Representative Lippert. My name is Carrie Jennings, and I'm Research and Policy Director for Freshwater. We're a 52-year-old Minnesota water nonprofit, and I appreciate the opportunity to testify in support of House File 3459. What we've done over the last 30 or so years is accidentally create a new normal for our rivers that has them full to the brim for many weeks of the year. And as a result, they're expanding their channels to accommodate the new flows. This is through a combination of increased annual precipitation, more high intensity rainfall events, and then the crops that require drainage to thrive, um, which means we have increased flow to the Minnesota River and its tributaries, as well as the tributaries in southeastern Minnesota to the Mississippi. Those would be the Root, the Whitewater, the Zumbro, and the Cannon. These are our main agricultural areas that have need drainage. The rivers are responding before our eyes, and this has led to dangerous and unsustainable levels of erosion of land. 
An immediate solution to this problem is to temporarily store water on land at critical times of year, and that would be April through June, and in key places, and that would be in the headwaters of these rivers. And this will immediately reduce the erosive power of the rivers throughout their lengths. This new water quality and storage program that's being administered by Bowser will deliver financial incentives to landowners who are willing to temporarily store water on land during that critical time period. And let me explain a little bit more about why this is so important. In the upstream end of all these rivers, there are dramatic increases in channel width and the they range from two to 10 inches per year. And if you own land along a river, you will notice this erosion eating up your yard, undercutting your home and field fence lines dropping into the river. Meanders are also moving faster or blowing out altogether, straightening rivers and speeding them up. Then at the downstream end, people on the Minnesota from Chaska to the Mississippi Confluence and on into Lake Pepin, but also in the lower route, Whitewater, Zumbro, and Cannon have to dig out from repeated inundation of sediment. And this is not only deposited in the navigation channel, but on trails and roads in the floodplains. I was part of a team of scientists that began studying this problem in 2006, and that work included convening stakeholders for six years, and that was state agribusiness leaders and environmental organizations, and we were looking for cost-efficient and fair strategies that they could agree on, and they all agreed that temporary water storage was the most effective tool and affordable tool to reduce river flow and bank erosion, and this new water quality and storage program finally gives us the financial tools to help communities through their estimates. SWCDs to work with willing landowners to put projects on the ground. You probably know more than I do how easy it is to spend a million dollars, but in the outreach I've done to SWCDs across these watersheds, I can imagine spending a million dollars on probably three to four really well-designed projects in the headwaters of one of the tributaries that we're slowing the water down will protect the entire river downstream. And I think that's worth it because the funded projects have to demonstrate that the flow reduction that they will achieve. And they can't be just random acts of conservation anywhere on the landscape. So we are supporting this additional 5 million in bonding for this new program because we know that this agreed upon solution will help restore our rivers to their more natural flows. And 5 million, just think, it could help five more tributaries. What we can't afford is to have our rivers continue to completely remodel their channels. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jennings. Members, any questions for Representative Lippert? Seeing none, uh, thank you, Representative Lippert, for presenting House File 3459. Any quick closing comments? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So these are well-studied practical solutions, and this funding would really help cities like Northfield and others across uh, southern Minnesota. So thank you for the time today. Thank you, Representative Lippert. Next up is the final bill for the, the day, House File 2833. And Representative Freiberg, I understand that you have an A1 amendment, so please explain that when you're giving your presentation. Sure, happy to do that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> um, so we've already heard about inflow and infiltration needs around the state today. I always forget the distinction between inflow and infiltration, so I looked it up before this hearing. Infiltration is groundwater that enters the sanitary sewer system through defects in sanitary sewer pipes. Inflow is the addition of clear water into the sanitary, sanitary sewer system at points of direct connection to the sanitary sewer system. Both of these cause problems because they can overload the sanitary sewer system, which can cause serious environmental problems, or it can lead to sewer backups in people's homes. That happened to me, and I can tell you that I would not wish that upon my own worst enemy. But fixing sewer pipes can require excavating a yard or digging up a street and can easily run into the thousands of dollars, which many people simply cannot afford. INI is a huge problem, both statewide and in the metro area. Uh, there are a few ways you can measure the scope of the problem uh, in the metro area, and there are different figures depending on whether you're looking at public sewer lines or privately owned sewer lines. Um, if you're looking at, non -regional, at the non-regional collection system, which means uh, city-owned and private pipes, the Met Council has estimated the cost to, repair, to address inflow and infiltration to be about $150 million based on flow rates and average costs. Um, I'd also like to draw your attention to a document in your packet titled INI Grant Program Application Estimates. This lists the cities in the metro area that have applied for INI funds. It shows a total cost of $65 million. So House File 2833 tackles the INI problem in a couple of ways. It provides bonding funds to cities to tackle INI in their communities. It provides a general fund allocation to help cities and private residents tackle INI and focuses on households that meet income guidelines. 
So we're still figuring out the ideal amounts to include in this bill, but um, for your request, uh, I'd, like you to, I'd like to draw your attention to the A1 amendment, which shows some potential amounts. So the $12.2 million figure was arrived by taking the $17 million figure from the grant eligible funds in the spreadsheet and subtracting the $5 million funded in 2020. The $133 million figure was arrived at by taking the $150 million uh, that I mentioned previously that's uh, total needs and subtracting the $17 million, which is pretty covered. The $48 million figure is the amount from the spreadsheet that is not grant eligible, and the $85 million is the difference between the $48 million and the $133 million. It's presumably the amount needed to address the problem with private sewer lines. Um, so that's just a little bit of background. I know Patricia Nauman from Metro Cities is here to speak, and I believe the Met Council staff is also available if there are questions. Director Nauman, please identify yourself and proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Patricia Nauman. I'm the Executive Director of Metro Cities. And just as brief uh, background, Metro Cities does represent the shared interests of cities in the seven county metropolitan area at the legislature executive branch, as well as the Metropolitan Council. Um, just to, I, I won't repeat what <laughs> Representative Freiberg said about the background on I and I, so I appreciate that. That's something that we've talked about um, for many years, and certainly appreciate Representative Freiberg's uh, sponsorship of this bill, and certainly your interest, Mr. Chair, and other members for your interest and attention to the to the issue of inflow and infiltration mitigation. I'll just say more than 100 metro area communities do own and operate local sewer, sewer systems that do connect to the Met Council's regional interceptor system. So. The, the uh, local and regional systems are very connected. And the Metropolitan Council does certainly uh, measure the flows that come into the regional uh, collection system from, from local sources. And so cities in the metropolitan area are often found to be contributing what are considered excess levels of INI into the wastewater collection system. Um, as, as Representative Freiberg mentioned, these sources are both public and private from both the sort of the manholes and sewers and also, you know, things like foundation drains and private laterals. Uh, both certainly are problems for the, the metropolitan region as a whole. Uh, mitigation work is generally done most cost effectively at the local level rather than at the regional level. Um, in other words, at the regional level, it would be having to build more wastewater pipe to accommodate what is essentially clean water flowing into the system. Cities in the metropolitan area have, um, I, I want to just first thank the legislature for its uh, support over the last several years for INI mitigation assistance to cities in the metro area. INI is an ongoing problem. It's uh, certainly due to aging infrastructure and just peak rain events that contribute to both the inflow and infiltration sides of this problem. And cities have undertaken and taken very seriously the work that needs to be done to mitigate um, INI um, occurrences at the local level. So I do really appreciate the opportunity to support funding for INI. We have um, certainly supported consistently funding through the state capital appropriations bills. And typically the request we've made is somewhere in the range of 10 million. That does um, certainly take into account the local match that is required through state bonding dollars. Um, if there were not a match, if it was done through cash, certainly a higher amount could be appropriated and that would be sustainable at the local level. Um, I also, Metro Cities also recognizes the uh, very critical uh, piece of this problem that is on the private side. And frankly, there are many local efforts going on to try to, to get at those efforts. They are very complex, obviously very expensive and certainly involve um, homeowners having to make, to make fixes. So we have worked with the Metropolitan Council over the years um, to try to get funding for that purpose. So certainly uh, state support for that is very uh, important as well. Um, I will just note also that again, just to, to note the uh, ongoing nature of INI work and the importance of ongoing support, you know, to both accommodate what cities can do at the local level in any given year, as well as the maturation period for any state bonding dollars. So, I, as as Representative Freiberg indicated, we're still um, we are talking with uh, him about sort of what the appropriate amounts should be, and I will continue to talk with our cities about that as well. So, appreciate your time, Mr. Chair and members, and would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, uh, Director Nauman. Uh, members, any questions for Representative Freiberg or Director Nauman? Uh, Chair Hansen. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, uh, Representative Freiberg. And mentioning the communities of the 100 communities and having listened to presentations uh, throughout the day, it seems like some communities are in the same situation where they have a low tax base. Uh, they don't have the ability to provide uh, the match, the same things we heard with the rural communities. 
that are requesting uh, millions of dollars. It seems, you know, in, in my district, West St. Paul uh, has had a program for many years. And, but when you're looking at uh, each of the communities, there's some with millions of dollars of needs. I, I'm thinking of Newport also having uh, an extremely high request without the capacity. So um, looking at, at equity and looking at where, where there's need, you know, if we're providing uh, $1 for the PFA for Greater Minnesota, I think we need to have the same dollar there and solve the problem. Um, just from your personal experience and working with communities, what, what do you see in trying to uh, problem solve here? Sure, Farber. Um, yeah, so I just, I'm not totally sure I'm f f uh, grasping the question. I mean, uh, you know, there's obviously a huge need in communities. As you pointed out, this exists in the metro area as well as greater Minnesota. I think there's need across the state. Um, so I think it's important that we have a very substantial investment to address this. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think you're, your point about the the match um, being difficult for many communities to meet is spot on. And um, if there's a, you know, this would be, I think, a circumstance where we could consider not requiring a match just because um, there's such a huge need that's beyond the capability of many cities to address on their own when they're also trying to provide other vital services to their residents. If I'm not answering your question, um, just uh, please let me know and I can clarify. Sure, Hanson. That, uh, that was it. Um, I, I think we need to make sure, you know, if it, if it was only $20 million, we'd be at the same stage of slowly admiring the problem and uh, uh, metering out the support when we have the dollars and the capacity we have now, uh, we should work at problem solving and get it done. And then we don't have to be talking about INI &I anymore because it would be done. Thank you, uh, Chair Hansen. No other questions, uh, members. That's wrap, uh, wrap up our agenda for today. Thank you, uh, Chair Feiberg and Ms. Nauman for coming by. Our next meeting is Tuesday, March 1st. We will be having on the agenda bills to address the housing crisis and related bills. And all bills, as a reminder, will be heard on an informational only basis. This meeting is adjourned.